Welcome. My name is Peter Toy, and I'm one of the English pastors at Brow Trail Baptist Church. Thank you for deciding to join with us as we look into God's Word today. Today we'll be looking at the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 1 to 20. And the title for the message is, How God Sees Sin. But before we look into God's Word, let's look to God together. Let's pray. Father, as we look into your word, I pray for your spirit. Guide us. Teach us. Open our ears so we can hear you. Open our minds so we can understand. Open our hearts so that we can receive your word and be changed. Lord, we are so dependent upon you to work. And we look to you to accomplish your purposes in our lives for your glory. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. God treats sin very seriously. This is a story about a football coach from Georgia Southern College. His name was Irk Russell, and he really wanted to keep drugs out of the change room, out of the lives of his um, football players. So what he did is he had two students get a 12-foot rattlesnake, bring it in during one of the meetings, burst through the doors of the change room, and then throw the rattlesnake on the table. This is what Russell says happened. Everyone screamed and scattered. I told them, when cocaine comes into a room, you're not nearly as apt to leave as when that rattlesnake comes in, but they'll both kill you. And you know, exactly the same thing can be said about sin. I think there are some sins that we minimize, we don't think is so serious. Not a big deal. But when God looks at sin, He sees it as something that's deadly something that can destroy us. Today we're going to be looking at the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verses 1 to 20. We're starting a new series and we'll be looking at this, this great book by this um, prophet, this man of God. We find out a little bit about the background of the book from verse 1. It says, The vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah, son of Amos saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. We find out from this passage that Isaiah spoke during the reigns of four kings, so we can pinpoint when his ministry was. It fell between 739 to 681 BC. And these were turbulent years, years where Judah faced um, incursions from their neighboring countries and the kings themselves they varied in how effective they were as leaders and they varied in terms of the character how holy they were how closely they followed Yahweh God we also find out that Isaiah his father his name was Amos and from Jewish tradition we learned that Amos was the son of I'm sorry, was the brother of Amaziah, who was a king. So if that's true, then Isaiah was from royal lineage. So he would have had access to the kings of Judah in Jerusalem. And that's where he lived, in Jerusalem. We find out later on in the book that he's married and he has some children. And this book of Isaiah is a rich book of the Bible. It's filled with many important and meaningful passages and very memorable prophecies. Now, as we work our way through the book of Isaiah, uh, we're not going to look at every single verse. There's 66 chapters in Isaiah and they're long chapters. If we did that, it would take us over two years. Instead, we're just going to highlight some key passages 
to get us a flavor, a taste of what the book of Isaiah is all about. The message of Isaiah, it, it fluctuates back and forth between messages of judgment, messages of condemnation, and also visions of hope, of a beautiful future to come. Watch just a portion of um, the outline of the book of Isaiah brought to you by the Bible Project. The book of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah lived in Jerusalem in the latter half of Israel's kingdom period, and he spoke on God's behalf to the leaders of Jerusalem and Judah. He spoke, first of all, a message of God's judgment. He warned Israel's corrupt leaders that their rebellion against their covenant with God would come at a cost, that God was going to use the great empires of Assyria and after them Babylon to judge Jerusalem if they persisted in idolatry and oppression of the poor. But that announcement was combined with a message of hope. Isaiah believed deeply that God would one day fulfill all of his covenant promises, that he would send a king from David's line to establish God's kingdom, remember 2 Samuel 7, that he would lead Israel in obedience to all of the laws of the covenant made at Mount Sinai, remember Exodus chapter 19. And all of this was so that God's blessing and salvation would flow outward to all of the nations, like God promised to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And it's this hope that compelled Isaiah to speak out against the corruption and idolatry of Israel in his day. I urge you to watch that entire video. We only showed you a piece of that. The uh, link is in the description of this video. I encourage you to take the time to, to watch the whole thing, to get caught up in the book of Isaiah. As I said, today we'll be looking at the first 20 verses of chapter 1. And I've split this passage into four parts. And they are, number one, God's view of sin. Number two, the results of sin. Number three, the impossibility of atoning for our own sin. And number four, the cure for sin. Let's look at the first point, God's view of sin. Take a look at verses two to four of Isaiah chapter one. Hear, O heavens, listen, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they rebelled against me. The ox knows his master, the donkey his owner's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. A oh, sinful nation, a people loaded with guilt, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption, they have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on him. You know, often I think when we think about our own sins, we try to, to minimize them. We make all sorts of excuses. Maybe you've heard people use these excuses. Maybe you've used them yourself. Everyone is doing it. I'm not hurting anyone. I'm not as bad as that other guy. Oh, she's just too sensitive. He can't take a joke. That's just the way I am. But you see, when we make those kinds of excuses, we are not taking seriously how God views sin. And that's the issue. The issue isn't what other people think about sin. The issue isn't what, even what we think about sin. The issue is, what does God think about sin? And this passage tells us what God's view of sin is. And he tells us in verse 2, at the end of verse 2, that the Israelites had rebelled against him. And you see that again. Verse 5, why do you persist in rebellion? At the heart of sin is this issue of rebellion. We have within us the desire to live free of the control of God. We want to live our lives on our own. So we turn our backs upon God. We shake our fist at Him. And we chart our own journey, our own life. Now, you may think, that sin is a bunch of actions that are evil or wrong. Things like lying, cheating, stealing, committing adultery, getting drunk, and a whole host of other things. And don't get me wrong, the Israelites did do wrong deeds. You see that in verse 4. It says, Ah, sinful nation, a people loaded with guilt, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. 
And in verse 10, God refers to the leaders of Jerusalem as the rulers of Sodom and Gomorrah. And in verse 15, God talks about how the people have blood-stained hands. But at the core of sin, at the root of sin, is this issue of rebellion. And in these verses, verses 2 to 4, God illustrates this rebellion in three ways. The first way, he says, rebellion is like children who turn their backs on their parents. That's what it says in verse 2. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. And if you're a parent, you know how much you've done for your children when they're just a babe in arms, you stayed up all night with them, you had to wake up every time they cried, fed them, nursed them, changed their diapers. As they grew older, you, you cared for them. When they were sick, you were by their bedside. You couldn't wait until that fever broke. When they started the first day of school, you are waiting impatiently for them to come home, worried about how they would get along. When they were struggling with their work, you, you struggled with them, helping them with their homework. And then as, as they grew older, you had to save your resources and start your own bank account so you'd have enough money so that when your kids got ready for university, you could help them out, you could pay for them. Parents do so much for their children. And when children turn their backs on their mothers and fathers, that's a supreme act of unthankfulness and selfishness. But you know, no matter how bad that act is, it's far worse when we, the creation, turn our back on our Creator. Think of all that God has done for us. Think of all that God has done for the Israelites. God chose the Israelites as His own people. He rescued them out of the nation of Egypt when they were slaves. He, he took them across the desert and took them to the, the promised land his inheritance and he removed nation after nation so that they could have a place to dwell but then the Israelites turned their backs on God instead they chased after other gods idols false gods Ezekiel chapter 16 we won't read it today but if you have a chance I urge you to read it it, it, it paints this picture of God walking through the field and seeing a baby abandoned in the field, kicking in its own blood. And that baby was Israel. So God gave her life. Then God gave her clothes and raised her. He dressed her in, in the finest linen, gave her rubies and jewelry, and gave her the best food until she grew up to be the most beautiful woman in the world. And then what did she do after she grew up? Well, she used all the things that her heavenly father had given her. And she used them to allure lovers. She became a prostitute. She had relations with any man that she could. And she gave all of these gifts that God had given her to her lovers. That's a graphic picture of Israel turning their back on their true father. But you know, before we condemn Israel too quickly, I think we have to look at ourselves. Have we been unthankful? Just think. Everything that we have comes from God's hand our health, our intelligence, our skills, our families, our very life. They're all given by God. Do we give Him thanks? I remember once I was, as a teenager, I was talking with one of my friends, Andrew. He wasn't a Christian. And we talked about being thankful to God. And Andrew said, I don't see why I need to be thankful for God. 
I didn't even ask to be born. Why should I thank him? And I thought about it for a minute, then I asked him a question. I said, Andrews, if someone came up to you and gave you a million dollars, wouldn't you thank him? And Andrew said, of course I'd thank him. Then he said, well, God has given you so much more that's worth much more than a million dollars. Shouldn't you thank God? And Andrew got quiet and he thought about it. And then he nodded his head and said, maybe I should. And you know, for Christians, it's n those aren't even the, the greatest things that God has given us. These physical things. The greatest gift that God has given us is his very own son, Jesus Christ. He sent his son to die for us on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins so we could be forgiven. And because God has done so much for us, we should be so thankful to him that we'll do anything for him. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10 verses 26 to 29, it gives a very stern warning to anyone who does not recognize what Jesus Christ has done. Let me read it to you. It says, If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him, and who has insulted the spirit of grace. To God, it's a very serious thing for his children not to be thankful to him. But there's a second picture in these verses about rebelliousness. The second picture is about an ox and a donkey that know their master. As it says in verse 3, right? The ox knows his master, the donkey his owner's manger. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. You see, animals know where they can go to get shelter, where they can go to get food, where they can go to get protection from the wolves or the lions or the bears. They go to the barn. They go to the farm and the farmer protects them. But the Israelites didn't know that. And sometimes I think we don't know that either. Instead of turning to the only one who can provide for us, who can protect us, who can give us what we need, then we try to go our own way. The Israelites did that. They turned to idols, seeking idols to answer their prayers. When foreign nations tried to invade them, Instead of going to God, what they did is they went to other nations and they tried to make alliances with them. They tried to pay them money so that they would come and fight on their behalf. You see, they didn't learn that the one who rescued them from Egypt, the one who delivered them through the desert and gave them the promised land, he was the one who could give them the safety and security, the life that they needed. The ox and the donkey, no. But we don't understand. And you know, we're not any better. Often, we run off and try just about everything else to find fulfillment in life other than God. We try to get achievement or success or to indulge our pleasures. And we think those things can bring us fulfillment and happiness and joy but in every case they disappoint they're empty when we run after anything else than God to provide the things that we really need then we are rebellious and really we are foolish I think Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 13 describes how God sees us when we're in that state. It says, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. <laughs> you get that picture. When we rebel by trying to find another source of life than God himself, 
Well, we're like people who try to go in the desert, even though there's a spring of water that we know exists. We go in the desert. And we try to dig our own wells. Instead, all we are really doing is we're digging our own graves. There's a, a third picture of what rebellion is like, and this picture is painted at the end of verse four. It says they have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel, and turned their backs on Him. The picture is. We turn our backs on God. We ignore Him. We close our ears to His call. We close our eyes to His welcoming arms, and we decide to go our own way. We decide to walk our own path. We are uh, stubbornly devoted to living life on our own. You know, I think a lot of us we don't trust God with our future. We think that what God has in store for Him, if we let Him have control of our life, then He'll give us a life that is boring, or a life that is filled with danger, or a life that is just unfulfilling. We think that if we give God complete control, if we follow Him. Then he'll make us into a single missionary, living in a third world country, spending all our time in a hut eating grubs. <laughs> But we have to realize that God is the one who created us. He gave us all of our desires. He knows what will cause us to be fulfilled. And God is good. He doesn't want to make our lives miserable. He wants to make our lives everything that it can be. You know, we think we can have control of our lives, and we make our plans. Maybe you've made your five-year plans and ten-year plans, and where you want to be in twenty years. But we can't control the future. Just think about this year that's just passed. How many of us could have predicted? Over the past year, there would be a lockdown and there would be a pandemic. You know, we think often that life will go in a straight line, but it rarely, if ever, does. Look at this picture. This is more realistic. We think that life is like that straight line, but it's not. It's that line underneath. Life happens. Things happen that we have no control of. Doesn't that make a, a a whole lot more sense to put our trust in the only one who knows what's going to happen in the future? In fact, who controls what happens in the future? In God Himself. You know, I wish I'd learned this a long time before, but I've discovered that every time. I refuse to follow God. If I refuse His invitation, I regret it. But every time I choose to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, then when I look back, I'm so thankful that I have. And and even more than that, you know, in the in the big scheme of things, it doesn't even matter where our life ends up. It doesn't matter where the the final. Destination will be. It doesn't matter how many jobs I've had. It doesn't matter how many achievements I've made. It doesn't matter how many check marks I've gotten on my bucket list. What matters is not what I've done. What matters is who, during my life, I have learned to love. And the one person that we were created to love is God Himself. And if we come to the end of our lives, and we've achieved that goal of loving God, then our lives will be fulfilled, because that's what we've been created for. In fact, the most harmful thing that we can do is to turn our backs on the one 
who created us and the one who loves us. That brings us to our second point, the results of sin. Look at Isaiah chapter 1, verses 5 to 10. Why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured. Your whole heart is afflicted. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness, only wounds and welts and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with oil. Your country is desolate. Your cities burned with fire. Your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before you laid waste as when overthrown by strangers. The daughter of Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a hut in a field of melons, like a city under siege. Unless the Lord Almighty had left us some survivors, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. When we sin, we only hurt ourselves. The picture here is of being beaten from the top of our heads to the soles of our feet. And this injury is both individual and also it affects others. Individually, we know it's true. We know the negative effects that sin has upon people. Think of addictions that people have and how they imprison people. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12 says, Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. As Christians, we don't live by a list of do's and don'ts, but we have to be careful of the things that we choose to do, that they don't harm us or they don't become addictions to us. And of course, that covers things like drugs and alcohol and porn, but it also can cover things like shopping or watching too much TV or, or playing video games or, or exercising too much. It, it could cover anything. Have you ever heard of a, a coconut trap for monkeys? What people do in Southeast Asia, they, to catch monkeys, they take a coconut, they bore out a small hole and then they hollow out the coconut from the inside. This hole is big enough for a, a monkey to put its open hand in, to slip it in. And inside the coconut, they'll put some kind of bait, some foods, maybe some fruit that the monkeys like. Then they'll chain this coconut onto a stake. And what what happens is an inquisitive monkey will come along, it'll take a look at the coconut, and it'll stick its hand in to try to get the fruit inside. But after it grabs onto the fruit and makes a fist, it's unable to pull it back out of the hole. And this monkey will refuse to let go of this fruit up until the time that the hunter returns and grabs and captures the monkey and has for himself monkey stew. And that's a picture of addic addictive sins. We grab hold of them. We don't want to let go of them, even if it means that it'll lead to our deaths. How about you? Do you have any addictive sins in your life that you know is hurting you? Let it go. Get rid of it. As it says in verse 5, why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you persist in rebellion? rebellion? Your whole head is injured, your whole heart afflicted. But you know, not only can sin hurt us individually, but it can hurt those around us. In fact, it can cause even the fall of nations. That's the fate of Israel. It says in, in verses 7 and 8 that neighboring countries have invaded Israel because of their sin. They've burnt down cities. They've taken people captive. They've um, taken all the crops from the fields and left the Israelites with nothing. God is very clear to the Israelites 
the uh, results of sin. This is what Deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 15 to 19 says. However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and degrees I'm giving you today, all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. You'll be cursed in the city and cursed in the country. Your basket and your kneading trough will be cursed. The fruit of your womb will be cursed and the crops of your land and the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. You will be cursed when you come in and cursed when you go out. Well, we've looked at number one, the first point, God's view of sin. And we've looked at the second point, the results of sin. Now I want to look at the third point, the impossibility of atoning for our sin. Look at verses 11 to 15 in Isaiah chapter 1. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations, I cannot bear your evil assemblies. Your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. God had prescribed in the law they gave the Israelites a sacrificial system. And this sacrificial system was a means by which the Israelites could show their sorrow for the sin that they have had committed. But very quickly, the Israelites turned the sacrificial system into a payment. In their minds, they thought that if they offered sacrifices, that that would pay for their sins. It would make atonement for the wrong they had done. But the sacrifice of animals could never, ever pay for the sins of people. Take a look at what it says in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 to 4. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are, to, that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason it can never, by the same sacrifice repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshippers would have been cleansed once for all, and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. You see that passage in Hebrews makes it very clear that the sacrifices of bulls and goats and lambs that the Israelites offered were never intended to pay for sins. Then why were their offerings? Why did God set the sacrificial system? Well, I can think of two reasons. First reason is that it showed how serious the sin was. It showed how much sin cost. The cost of sin was death. The Israelites, however, thought that the sacrificial system was a means by which they could appease God and then continue to live the lives the way they wanted to. They didn't come with repentance. In fact, it says that when they came, when they even prayed to God, they prayed with blood-stained hands. They felt by doing these religious ceremonies, giving offerings, going to festivals, observing the Sabbaths, then God would be pleased with them, even though they were still sinning, even though they didn't change their lives. But God makes it crystal clear that He found their religious service, their ceremonies, as something that was wearying, something that was repugnant to him. Because when they offered their sacrifices, they didn't offer it with sincere hearts of repentance. Before we condemn the Israelites too much, maybe we can look at ourselves. Do we ever have this mentality? I've heard of some people who take the Lord's Supper communion and think that by taking it they are forgiven their slate is clean so then they can go on sinning until the next time they have communion now I think for most of us our attitude isn't that blatantly wrong 
But have you ever thought that if you go to church or if you pray more or if you read the Bible or if you share the gospel, if you do some service for God, then God will more quickly forgive you. That's wrong thinking. You see, nothing that we do, no good act, no matter how good it is, can pay our penalty for sin. The Bible is very clear. There's only one thing that can pay for sin, and that's death. But the death of an animal can never pay for the sin of a person. To pay for sin, either we die or someone else dies in our place. The only problem is that no one can die for us because everyone is sin. I can't die for you because I already have a debt. I'm a debtor. I already owe myself. And you can't die for me either. Then what's the solution? Well, I said that there are two reasons I could think of for the sacrificial system. The first was to show the seriousness of sin. Sin could only be paid for by death. But the second reason God gave us the sacrificial system was it foreshadowed God's solution to sin. You see, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be the answer for our sin. When um, John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus approaching, this is what he called him in John chapter 1, verse 29. He said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, Jesus Christ when he came to earth, he did a lot of great things, but the main reason he came was to pay the penalty for our sins. You see, he lived a perfect sinless life, the only person who ever had. So he was the only candidate who could die for another person's sin. And when Jesus Christ died on the cross, that's exactly what he did. He died in our place. He took this penalty that we deserved. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And not only did Jesus Christ die for his sins, but because he was God, death couldn't hold him. And three days later, he rose again from the dead and he ascended on high. And you see, right now he's sitting at the right hand of the throne of God and he's opened up the way for us to come to heaven. Now, how do we do that? How do we reach Jesus Christ and live with him forever. Well, that brings us to our fourth and final point. The cure for sin. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 1 verses 16 to 18. It says this, Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. What's the cure for sin? What do we do? Well, there's two steps. First is repentance. Repentance means that we change our mind. Because our minds are changed, then we change our behavior. Basically, it means that we stop doing what's wrong and we start doing what's right. Exactly what verses 16 and 17 says. We are to wash the blood up from our hands. We're to make ourselves clean. We're to get rid of the evil deeds. And we are to do right. And there's a list of things to do right. To seek justice, to encourage the oppressed, to defend the cause of fathers, and plead the case of the widow. When John the Baptist came, he preached a message of repentance. And when he baptized people, there's a baptism of repentance. Mark chapter 1, verse four, five, 4 and 5 says, And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. These people came to listen to John, and they made a decision to change their lives. 
to put off evil and to do good. And to symbolize that, they were baptized. They went down the water and they died to their own self and they came up again to live a new life. But that step of repentance is only the first step. John, in his ministry, he knew he wasn't the final answer. He knew he was just a stepping stone to the one who was to come. He was the messenger declaring the coming of the Messiah. Mark chapter 1 verse 7 and 8, it tells John's message. It says, And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I am, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Repentance is the first step, but it's not the final step. Repentance prepares us to turn to Jesus Christ and to place our trust on him. And when we do that, then something miraculous happens. Our sins are forgiven. And Jesus Christ gives us his Holy Spirit to live within us. Look what verse 18 says. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. I remember when I first heard this message, the gospel, and I turned to Jesus Christ. That was almost 40 years ago. It was the best decision I've ever made when I look back at it. It, it changed the whole direction of my life. And you can make that decision today. You can come to Jesus. You can repent. And then you can turn to Him and trust Him for what He has done for you on the cross and receive His forgiveness and the gift of eternal life. This passage ends with both a promise and a warning, a promise for those who do repent and turn to God, and a warning for those who don't. Let me read them to you. It says, If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best from the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Don't turn your back on God. Today, you have received Christ's invitation. Repent, turn to Jesus, and trust Him. And you'll find that it's the best decision you've ever made. Right now, I'm giving an opportunity to do that as we spend some time in prayer. Won't you pray with me? Father, I thank you that though we have sinned and turned our backs up against you in rebellion, you reached out to us. You sent your best for us. You allowed your son to die and take the penalty that we deserved. And you've opened a way for us to be forgiven and to have eternal life and to be with you forever. Father, we thank you. And Lord, right now in this silence, please listen to our prayers. And if you want to receive this forgiveness of God. If you want to repent and turn to Jesus, just speak to him now during this time of silence. Father, thank you for listening to our prayers. And I pray, Father, for those who have made decisions to repent, to follow you, to trust in Jesus. Please seal this decision in their hearts and help them as they live their new life for you. I pray and ask these things in Christ's powerful name. Amen.